slime. It's all around us, all the time. It creeps through the forest in the dead of night. Slugs use it in their bizarre sex life. And every mammal on Earth is born covered in it. When things die, they rot in slime. It's not pretty. But gooey, sticky, or just runny, slime is everything. Most of us don't realize it, but every minute of every day, we're surrounded by slime. You know that fur you feel on your teeth in the morning? Yes, it's plaque, but it's also a biofilm of slime. Bacteria secrete it so they can stick to your teeth. There's no getting away from it. Slime is everywhere. So what is slime? The dictionary tells us it's any sticky substance, especially when disgusting or unpleasant. And many of us have grown up associating it with things that slither or scare us. Maybe that's why we still think of slime as something unpleasant. But without slime, we wouldn't be here. We're all creatures from the swamp. About four billion years ago, in slime like this, the building blocks of life were generated, the stuff that made us. We don't know how it happened. There's only one thing for sure. It happened in slime. But where did this life-creating slime come from? There are reported sightings of foul-smelling gelatinous blobs dating back through the centuries. It was believed that this jelly was falling from the sky with meteors. Welsh shepherds called it the rot of the stars. Understanding the Earth's atmosphere, we now know it couldn't be space gum. So what was this unfamiliar substance that seemed to come from nowhere? Could it be a type of slime? We've all seen what happens to fruit when it's attacked by mold. Fungal growth engulfs it and eventually reduces it to slime. But the mold the Welsh shepherd saw is a different beast altogether. What we've got here is a slime mold a glistening mass of mucus that swarms over and engulfs its prey. It's frighteningly intelligent. It started life as a single cell. Then, like some sci-fi horror picture, it expanded itself, splitting into millions of individual cells. This is known as the plasmodium stage, from which things get really exciting. Triggered by the need for food, this slime goes hunting. All its cells coordinate to ooze in one direction. It keeps going until it finds prey and satisfies its hunger. Slime mold can even solve puzzles. In this experiment, scientists put slime at one end of a maze. At the other end are tiny fragments of food. It doesn't have a brain or eyes, but the slime cells that make up its body work together to find their prey. Once a feeler locates the food, it sends shock waves through the slime's body. There are electrical messages telling it how to reshape itself. Before long, the slime is one thick tube running directly through the maze. Lesson number one. Slime is clever. Without slime, we humans wouldn't last long. It's a vital part of our day-to-day -day lives, even helping to regulate our internal thermostat. 
Our bodies normally operate at a temperature of 37 degrees centigrade. If our temperature increases beyond that, we're in trouble. At the first sign things are getting steamy, thousands of tiny glands in our skin release sweat. Once on the surface, the sweat mixes with the skin's natural oils. More slime. The sweat evaporates to cool us down, and the oily secretions left on the surface inhibit the growth of unhealthy microbes. So, thanks to this slimy mixture, your skin stays healthy and cool. Which is just what is needed when you are in the blistering heat of the African sun. But most animals don't sweat. So how do they cool up? Take the hippo. Not a bead of sweat in sight, but it's still using slime to keep cool. Specialized cells in its skin secrete a gooey substance that turns from red to brown when exposed to the sun. It's recently been discovered that this red slime absorbs UV light and acts as a sunscreen. But what if you're covered with fur? It's more of a problem. Dogs have to sweat through their paws. But that's not enough. They also drool. Just like sweat, as it evaporates, the saliva draws heat from the body. We humans drool for a more obvious reason. To help our food go down. Every day, your salivary glands release more than five coffee cups of slime. And that's a lot of slime. And sometimes, the slime we swallow isn't even our own. Wherever there is food, there are flies. This one is found almost everywhere. Meet the housefly. It's one of the slimiest characters around. When a fly lands on food, it extends a long tube called a proboscis. It uses this tube to spit through. The saliva then dissolves the food and the fly sucks it up. If fly saliva on your food is not bad enough, things are about to get worse. Flies live and breed on dead organic remains. Put simply, they lay their eggs on feces and dead bodies. Look up close and you can see fine hairs on their legs and sticky pads on their feet. It's a perfect design for transporting dirt from one place to another and spreading disease. And that's what all flies do best. After they've paddled around on something disgusting and eaten some of it, they land on the food we humans eat. With them, they bring typhoid, cholera, diarrhea, dysentery, tuberculosis, and by way of an encore, parasitic worms. The hairs on this fly's body don't just help spread disease, it uses them to smell. Attracted by the irresistible stench of rotting flesh, she lands on a corpse and settles in for dinner. After the finger licking good meal, the fly notices that this nice, slimy spot might be a good place to lay her eggs. And those eggs soon become maggot larvae, which tunnel deep inside the dead body. Then, just like their parents, these maggots release liquefying enzymes and feast on the rich mush of the corpse's flesh. What could be more helpful? This is nature's funeral part. Through this slimy process, the maggots can consume 60% of a corpse in less than one week. Once they've gorged themselves and the dead body is nothing but bones and fur, the maggots pupate. They emerge as flies, and the cycle of slime resumes. Not pleasant, but pretty tame when compared with the deadly slime spread by another member of the fly family. The bite of the mosquito indirectly kills more than 3,000 people every day. Mosquitoes carry malaria and many other fatal diseases. 
They kill more humans worldwide in five minutes than sharks do in a whole year. And it's all because of the slime that is saliva. Tiny single-celled parasites called protozoa live in the mosquito's stomach and salivary glands. When a mosquito bites you, it injects the parasites along with its saliva. Once inside, these microscopic killers invade red blood cells, the vital carriers of oxygen in your body. They multiply until the cells burst, releasing even more parasites. Eventually, so many red blood cells are destroyed that the body is starved of oxygen and you die. And all because of the salivary slime that a mosquito injected. But we can't blame all mosquitoes. Male mosquitoes don't bite you. It's only the girls. That's because mosquitoes use blood protein for just one purpose, to create eggs. At one moment, slime kills, but at another, it gives life. From start to finish, sex too is all about slime. These determined little guys are a combination of water and a slimy gel-like substance called cytoplasm. Continuing this slimy theme, sperm are suspended in a fluid called semen, which is designed to change into a gelatinous liquid shortly after launch, just to give the little guys some extra sticking power. Slime is the lubricant of life. Some animals don't just need slime, they are slime. Slugs and slime are inseparable. It's not easy being slimy. Making mucus costs slugs a lot of energy. But it allows them to glide along the ground and stick to steep surfaces. It coats their rubbery skin, keeping moisture in, protects them from the rough surfaces they glide over, and even hardens during winter to shield them from the cold. But get this, for slugs, slime is also sexy. This slimy character is cruising for a mate. It's doing it by following the trail of another slug. Any slug will do. That's because, like all slugs, this is a hermaphrodite. It's both male and female. If it gets really desperate and can't find a mate, it can just have sex with itself. Finally, our slug embarks on a ritual that most guys would run a mile from. Penis jousting. A slug's penis is a magnificent weapon. It protrudes from its head and measures a third the length of its body. After an impressive amount of foreplay, which can sometimes last over 36 hours, they finally take it in turns to release sperm. So far, so good. But things aren't over yet for the happy couple. After mating, some slugs separate their entwined bodies by biting off their own penises. In the slug world, staying celibate has some definite advantages. Just like a slug, bacteria also secrete a protective layer of slime around themselves. And it's this slime that allows bacteria to live almost anywhere from volcanic vents to arctic ice. All bacteria secrete slime. It protects them from chemical changes going on around them and allows limited movement, doing away with the need for appendages like legs or fins. Bacteria simply use their sticky slime to attach themselves to almost anything. And human skin is no exception. Every square centimeter of our skin is host to five million bacteria. Just like bacteria, we too create slime to protect our bodies from the environment. An itchy nose is often quickly followed by a flow of mucus. It's an allergic reaction caused by something 
uh, probably pollen from the flowers. Normally, grains of pollen travel on the wind to fertilize other flowers. The pollen grain lands on the moist female part of a plant and explodes. Unfortunately, that's also what happens when pollen gets up your nose. But it's slime to the rescue. A runny nose is a good sign. The sticky slime bogs down anything that's trying to get in. More watery slime is produced to flush the pollen grains away. It's acting as a protective barrier. And that's one of slime's most important roles in nature. Protection. On the beach, there's an animal taking slimy protection to another level, using slime to build himself a castle. At low tide, you can see little turrets sticking out from the sand. This is the home of the sand mason. The worm uses mucus from its mouth just like cement. It glues together sand grains and fragments of shell to build a tube. It looks a haphazard process, but speed it up and things become a lot clearer. Once inside its turret, the worm is protected from predators. Safely guarded inside its shell and sand castle, it's ready for a snack. It sticks out its crown of tentacles and secretes a stream of mucus, sifting the water for passing food. Head out to sea and you'll find many animals that rely on slime for survival. Some species of parrotfish use it for protection. Each night, they go to sleep in a self-made cocoon of slime. It takes half an hour to create, but provides an effective hiding place from sharks that prowl the reef. Open at both ends to allow fresh water to flow through, and foul-smelling and tasting, the cocoon is a good deterrent to nighttime predators. The sharks cruise by and the fish sleep safely, in the shelter of their mucus nightgown. Come morning, the parrotfish are awake and picking at the coral. They're feeding on it because it's coated with a delicious slime. Hard corals produce sticky mucus that traps nutrient particles from the surrounding water and keeps them close to the reef. Reef dwellers feed on the nutritious slime. But importantly for the coral, some of the mucus falls to the sand below, where bacteria chomping on it secrete antibiotics that help the coral stay healthy. It's hard to see with a human eye, but this is why coral produce so much slime. It keeps everyone happy. Without slime, most sea life just wouldn't survive. If you've ever picked up a fish, you'll know that it's covered in a film of slippery slime. And you might also know that the slime is difficult to wash off your hands. What you may not want to know is that the slime contains mucus, just like the goo that comes out of your nose. Fish produce it for the same reason as we do, to help protect themselves from infection. It's created when a protein called mucin, made in the fish's skin, mixes with water and becomes mucus. A layer of slime surrounds the fish like a coat of armor, making it impossible for bacteria, fungi and parasites to get through. They can't attach to the scales because the slime makes it too slippery. And 
if one of these bump heads lived up to its name and scraped itself on the sharp corner, the slime would act as a band-aid, helping to heal the wound. Slime also allows fish to swim more efficiently by smoothing over the scales and reducing friction. If you want to live in the ocean, then you need slime to live. It's no surprise that the sea gave birth to the very first slimy animals. It all started around 600 million years ago when microscopic creatures like this made their appearance. It's plankton, the basis of the food chain in the entire ocean. Even animals as big as the manta ray feed on it. It's incredible that microscopic creatures help to sustain a fish with a wingspan of almost seven meters. That's bigger than many light aircraft. At first sight, plankton look like amorphous floating blobs. Go in close with a macro lens and you get a much more interesting picture. Just like the plains of Africa, this is a world with predators and prey. And this guy has a voracious appetite. It's called Capelia. The microscopic Capelia is possibly one of the smallest animals capable of seeing images. Moving lenses channel light down optic tubes to light-sensitive receptors, allowing them to track down the prey they need to eat their own body weight in food every day. Capelia cruises near the surface of the sea. It may be only 25 millimeters long, but it's a tiny predator on the lookout for even tinier prey. Plankton. The world of plankton is an alien place. You don't need eyes to be a successful hunter. Drifting through the sea, this animal snares crab larvae with its sticky spines. Bizarre they may be, but plankton are one of nature's great success stories, surviving through millions of years of evolution. The same can be said of comb jellies. As they say, if it works, don't fix it. A comb jelly is little more than a parcel of water surrounded by a flexible organic layer of slimy skin. Creatures like this are the ancestors of all the slimy creatures you find in the ocean today. There are a lot of them. That's because the sea is a perfect place to live if you're made of slime. If you haven't got a rigid, bony skeleton, then you need something to support your body. Float yourself in water and you've cracked it. There are almost no limits to what you can look like. That's why the sea is home to some of the world's most unusual creatures. The body of an octopus is a mass of spineless tissue. On land, it'd be a blob of slime, but it's perfectly adapted to life in the sea. In fact, this spineless wonder is one of the deadliest hunters on the planet. Masters of disguise, their suctioned tentacles are death grips, and paralysis by poison is their speciality. Never underestimate a slime. One of their most amazing attributes is their agility. In this setup, our octopus must squeeze through a hole one-tenth the size of its body. The only thing that limits where it can go is the size of its beak, the only bony part. Using its tentacles to feel its way around and pull itself forward, it soon makes it through. These guys are the Harry Houdinis of nature. 
masters of escape and masters of capture. And if an octopus catches hold of you, there's no escape. Each tentacle works as an individual, controlled by a nervous system that can even work independently from the main brain. Cut off a tentacle, and for a while, it will still grip you. Its suckers hold on tight. A new tentacle will grow back to replace the missing one. What it boils down to is that octopus are all but indestructible. They're incredibly strong. And with up to 2,000 suckers to hold on with, it's almost impossible to break their hold. Octopus can grow to immense proportions. This is the Pacific giant octopus, the largest octopus in the world. It can weigh more than 45 kilograms, grow to a length of around six meters, and live at depths of up to 762 meters. Surprisingly, giant octopus are actually quite common. This one lives off Vancouver Island in Canada. During the day, it shelters in caves amongst the rocks. A pile of bones and shells, known as a midden, is the only sign that the beast is in residence. It may not be pretty, but this is a real-life octopus's garden. Year by year, the remains of octopuses' victims pile up. A gruesome reminder to passers-by to keep out. A giant octopus lives here. If you're a little octopus, the rules change. This tiny creature doesn't want you to know it's around. It's so good at hiding itself away that the mimic octopus was only recently discovered. It lives on the shallow, muddy shores of Southeast Asia. With no coral or rocks to hide amongst, it's developed a unique way of defending itself. The mimic is the only known species of animal that can change shape depending on the predator that's approaching. One minute, it's impersonating a venomous sea snake. The next, a flatfish. The mimic octopus went completely unnoticed for centuries. Maybe because it looks different every time you see it. It was only in 1998 that scientists realized they discovered a new species. Spot one of these octopus cousins and stay well away. It's the blue ringed octopus. One of the most dangerous creatures on the planet. And it's slime that's the key to its success. Slime bacteria inside its salivary glands produce one of the world's most toxic venoms. It would take just one bite from a blue ring and your whole body would be paralyzed. Forget about screaming for help. You won't even be able to breathe. This little fellow's venom is 10,000 times more lethal than cyanide. And there's no known antidote. It's death by blue ring if you get there. In fact, several people each year succumb to blue ring venom and die. For this relatively small crab, death will come quickly. But for humans, it's a slow and terrifying end. To be
begin with, you may not even realize you've been bitten. A blue ring octopus bite isn't painful. But then the symptoms start. First you feel sick. Your speech becomes slurred. Your vision blurred. Your muscles stop working. But blue rings aren't aggressive and less provoked. If a potential predator approaches, it warns it to stay away by flashing bright blue circles and stripes. If you move from the shallows to the depths, you'll find the most bizarre of the ocean's slimy creatures. Welcome to the world of real-life monsters. Our pressure-sensitive human bodies can't go to where these earthly aliens live. But with slimy bodies made almost entirely of water, the deep ocean is the place where slime rules. This is no computer graphic. This is the vampire of the deep. Vampira tuthis infernalis. The ghostly form of the blood red vampire squid. Its name comes from the caped appearance of the webbing between its arms and eyes that appear red in some light conditions. It's only 28 centimeters long, but its eyes are as big as a large dog's. Compared to its body size, they're the largest in the animal kingdom. And he certainly needs powerful eyesight, living in almost total darkness at depths of up to 1,500 meters. what other creatures imagined only in our nightmares like down there. Nearer to the surface, slime can be just as deadly. It is thought that jellyfish have been drifting the ocean for over 600 million years. They float through life, letting the ocean currents bring food to them. Like a living sieve, they fish for plankton with their long, sticky tentacle. Their bodies have no hard parts at all. They're no more than a pulsating sack of slime. Being 99% water allows them to be almost transparent. Predators can't see them, and prey doesn't avoid them. When conditions are right, they mass together in vast, frightening swarms. These are the invisible killers of the deep. Jellyfish are among the most toxic of all marine animals. And this blue bottle or Portuguese man of war really packs a punch. Just one touch from its long drifting tentacles and you're injected with venom. Soon paralysis sets in. In extreme circumstances you'll suffer pain, fever and vomiting too. Without treatment you could even die. What's fascinating about this jellyfish is that it's not just one animal. It's a colony made up of four different types of polyp. The float is a single individual gas-filled polyp that serves as the mothership. Below the float hang long tube-like polyps, all individual animals. In jellyfish, we usually call them tentacles. If you're looking for a superorganism made of slime, this is it. Here's how this goo comes to life. Below the float, curtains of polyp tentacles spread out. Some are the sex organs of the colony, sacs containing either ovaries or testes. 
In addition to the sex organs, you find the sensory tentacles, highly sensitive to touch and temperature. Come into contact with one of them, and the whole colony knows you're around. And you'll certainly know about it, as these are also the killers of the colony. So how does a lump of slime kill you? These tentacles are covered in stinging cells. Here are the tiny killers on close-up. There are thousands of them on each tentacle, each one capable of firing a venom-tipped harpoon. The venom is a neurotoxin. It paralyzes prey and stops it swimming away. But how does it digest its food? Pity the poor sardine. These gastrozooids, or digestive polyps, are the warrior's guts. They engulf the prey and break it down. Eventually, even the sardine's bones will turn to goo. This nutritious slime is then shared amongst the colony. For the Portuguese man of war, it really is a life of slime. He may be the scariest, but he's far from the biggest. This fantastic animal is a lion's mane jellyfish, the largest in the world. Its tentacles can be up to 60 meters long. Each one is armed with thousands of lethal stings. If something touches a tentacle, it automatically gets stung. With its paralyzing sting, the lion's mane jellyfish may seem like the kind of underwater beast it would be best to avoid. But fortunately, for these jackfish, they've learned to recognize it too. In fact, they exploit it. They coat themselves with its slime to protect themselves from the stinging tentacles. They hitch a ride, gaining a safe haven from the ocean's predators. It's an example of how one creature has learned to take advantage of another. But sometimes the benefits are mutual. This is Cassiopeia, a peaceful vegetarian and a gardener. It's formed one of the most amazing relationships in nature with another slimy character. Each of its thousand tentacles is home to green algal growths. Cassiopeia feeds on them. In return, the algae get a safe place to live. The jellyfish is a living greenhouse in which the algae can safely flourish. They're ferried to the best spots for sunbathing and fed with nutrients and nitrogen from the pulsating jelly. This relationship, where both parties benefit, is called symbiosis. It's a love story between two very different but perfectly matched slimes. If you can't find protection with another animal, then shells make an ideal home for a slimy, soft-bodied creature. This is a cone shell snail. But don't be deceived by its appearance. It's not home to your average mollusk. This snail is deadly. Its secret weapon is a harpoon-like tooth with a deadly barb. Having targeted its prey, the cone shell lies in wait. The harpoon is released. Prey is paralyzed instantly. And swallowed whole. And throughout the attack, the snail remains safely in its shell. Other mollusks have found a different way of protecting themselves. Sea slugs, or nudibranchs, use bright colors to advertise that they're poisonous.
By absorbing toxins from their food, they can make themselves noxious to predators. But not all nudibranchs are capable of this. Some are quite harmless. They're just faking it, but the tactic still works. In fact, it's so effective that they blatantly display their finery on the reef during daylight hours. They're some of the most colorful creatures in the ocean, the flamboyant dandies of the world of slime. Less ostentatious is the sea slug's unfortunate prey, the sea squirt. They may seem insignificant blobs on rocks, filtering plankton from the passing water, but there's something incredibly special about them. Go back a stage in their life cycle, and something extraordinary emerges. In the tadpole stage, they have a primitive backbone a distinct line of nerve cells running the length of the body. It's thought that the descendants of these colorful blobs may have evolved into the first vertebrates, animals with backbone. That was when life started sprinting down a whole new road. Nothing so important or life-changing has evolved since. A blob of slime came up with the key to life out of the water. But if your slimy body is 99% water and you have no backbone, land is a dangerous place. This Portuguese man-of-war jellyfish is literally all washed up. It has no rigid skeleton and without the support of water, it can't move. In the hot sun, it will soon dehydrate and die. Anything that lives on land must continuously guard against drying out. It's a simple rule, but it governs life out of the water. It's a rule that applies to big and small. Even the thousands of tiny droplets that fly out of your nose when you sneeze. Each one containing masses of viruses looking for their next home. These rhinoviruses can survive on the skin or on inanimate objects for as long as three hours. Plenty of time to bump into a new host. And it takes no more than 30 of them to cause an infection. These jam packages leave your body at a speed of 167 kilometers an hour and spread up to three and a half meters. If your sneeze was a gust of wind, it would be strong enough to snap twigs off trees. If the germs are very lucky, they will find their way down an unwitting victim's throat where they can multiply in a warm, wet environment. Some animals take it a step further. Vultures spend their lives surrounded by germs, delving amongst the slime of carrion, dead, rotting bodies. That's why vultures have fewer feathers around their neck and head. There's less for the slime to hang on to. Fly maggots have already infested this carcass. In the end, there will be nothing left just slime. That's the way of the world. Slime is with us when we're born. And everything goes back to it when it dies. Slime is death's faithful assistant. But it may also hold the key to life in the future. It's recently been discovered that the slime produced by slugs could help us build supercomputers. The slug slime contains crystals that hold enormous amounts of information. So why would a slug try 
need to hold the information. When one slug crosses another's trail, crystals in the slime tell it which way the first slug was moving. It then makes what for a slug is a hard decision. Does it want to follow the first slug or go in another direction? Scientists believe that by copying the structure of these slime crystals, they may be able to design a chemical supercomputer with a massive memory capacity. That's the thing about slime. You never know when you're going to meet it next, or where. Slime may even travel from planet to planet. In January 2004, NASA's Opportunity rover landed on Mars after traveling 556 million kilometers through time and space. Its mission? To search for the holy grail of space exploration. Life as we know it on Earth. Take a look at this photo taken by the rover. Now look at this. This is a slime mold on Earth drying out. When life gets tough for a slime mold, it forms sporangia, balls of spores, often on the tips of stalks. The sporangia burst, and spores are dispersed by the wind. And the life cycle begins again. We're still not certain what exactly the rover found on Mars, but these images look uncannily similar to the spore heads of bacterial slime. We're talking mucus on Mars. Could this be? One wild theory is that the Earth was hit by a massive meteorite one and a half billion years ago. Pieces of rock were blasted into space and their path took them to Mars. Miraculously, they may have transported slime spores with them. And, as luck would have it, they landed during the watery epoch on Mars. Is this a mass of slime? Is this a fossilized slime root? Are these balls of slime spores? It's straight out of science fiction. Biological spores crossing the solar system and colonizing another planet. Unlikely, perhaps. But one thing's for sure. Slime is full of surprises. <laughs>